see in your eyes. The same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. But it is not this day. An hour of wolves and shattered shields when the age of men comes crashing down. But it is not this day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West! You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Just want to give you an idea of just how much has burned already. We're talking about 96 square miles. More than 60,000 acres have burned. This is where the biggest fire is. This is Ventura in Ventura County. Um, and if you take a look, I mean, you hear those numbers and you say, that sounds terrible. But then you look at the houses, you look at the hills. Some of them burn to the ground. And they're in little spots because the wind, the Santa Ana winds that we usually get in October, have shown up with a vengeance and have spread these fires so quickly that the fire departments are saying, look, we cannot get ahead of this. We have to let it burn out in some ways. They couldn't get aerial uh, help for quite a bit today because the winds were just so bad and the smoke made it almost impossible to see the front of the fire. There are now four fires burning here. Two in Los Angeles County, one here in Ventura County, and one in San Bernardino County. And the neighbors on this side of this house, everyone is trying to save their own homes as well as getting help from the firefighters. They have taken hoses and they've been spraying this down because if you look, this has been burning wolf for hours. It has just been smoldering. And any time the wind picks up, it can pick up those smoldering bits, throw the embers over into a tree or onto a roof, and it goes up just like that very quickly. We've been hearing explosions as well because you're hearing some of the transformers get so hot that they explode. Some of the neighbors said it sounded like grenades were going off all night long. The neighbor from this house actually helped get these folks awake and aware of what was going on as the fire burned all the way down the street and then leapt over onto their property. They have not seen this yet. There are a lot of people asking us to go to their homes to see how they are. We ended up just two streets down. And in that neighborhood, there are five homes in just a very short block that have been burned to the ground. This is devastating. And the governor has declared a state of emergency in this county alone. And that could spread because the fires that are happening elsewhere are growing rapidly because of the Santa Ana winds and because it's so dry. It is Friday, December 8th of 2017. And the doors are open in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, Thank you for joining us today on this Friday special uh, Blue Moon Spirits Friday. Yeah, we'll have a few dishes of, well, you know, edible sustenance. But uh, the focus will be on 
the spirits. Yes, indeed. Okay, we opened up uh, with an uh, update on the Los Angeles wildfires. Some people are calling them the California wildfires. But I think it describes it better by calling them, because there's quite a few, the Los Angeles wildfires. Because well, that's where it is, Southern California. And uh, when I grabbed this clip last night, um, 96 square miles uh, had been burned. But uh, it's well over 100 square miles now. So uh, uh, it's just devastating uh, emotionally what, for me, uh, what's going on. Uh, Hollywood Bowl is threatened, you know, right along there, along the 405. Then further up is the Getty Museum. Uh, that is threatened. So uh, uh, Santa Ana winds, I will say Santa Ana winds in December aren't that unusual, but they usually come in October. And, uh, oh, Santa Ana winds, they are the hot, dry winds that come off the desert, uh, sometimes about 60 to 70 miles per hour. And uh, it's, a, it's a desert phenomena, and um, it, it just exacerbates the, the, these wildfires. And uh, once the winds subside, uh, that will be very, very helpful. Okay. What are we attending to today in the Front Cafe? What's on the menu? Well, uh, we will uh, investigate Mick Mul Mulvaney. Yeah, that Mick Mulvaney is considering a lower fine than the multi-million dollar penalty the Consumer Bureau levied against Wells Fargo over those illegal mortgage fees. Okay. Being budget director isn't enough. He's got to go over to the Consumer Protection Bureau and, you know, deconstruct that, too. All right. Oh, the most hated restaurateur in America is hit with a lawsuit over wage theft just prior to opening a location in Trump's D.C. hotel at the old post office there. Hmm. Birds of a feather. And... The Export-Import Bank could vote as early as next week to make an anti-gay, anti-woman, anti-foreigner its new president. I mean, if you're going to have an Export-Import Bank president, what better person than to have in, in that position than an anti-foreigner? <sighs> this administration... After the break, of course, we uh, move everything from the front cafe back to the chef's table. And since it is Blue Moon Spirits Friday, rather than be modeling, we're going to step back a bit in history for a little classic dish from, well, the old family cookbook. Today, of course, is the 47th anniversary of John Lennon's murder. So uh, we'll listen to an appearance by John and Yoko Ono on the old Dick Cavett show from 11 September of 1971. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Bon appetit. All right. So, uh, of course, folks, if you go to NetRootsRadio.com, that is our homepage, and scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, you'll find the chat room link on the right side of the homepage there at the bottom, and Roaring Girl uh, monitors that quite frequently during the day, and sometimes she's just on it all the time. And then to the leftish of the chat room link are the contribute donate buttons, and thank you for your generosity. We are paying the bills and uh that says a lot you know so thank you no all all kidding aside and oh uh one other thing uh if you would like to get a hold of me you can find me on twitter at justice putnam that's an n before the m putnam we are of the higher class of putts now there are putmans and usually they were the carriage drivers, and the Putnams were the manufacturers of the carriages. You can look it up. Oh, boy. Okay, so uh, why don't we 
tuck into these uh, dishes that we have uh, set up for the front cafe this morning. And, uh, you know, when you've got some people who are deconstructing the administrative state, they have to wear many hats. Because as you deconstruct, you know, you are getting rid of not only institutions, but people, too. And uh, so so you, so the managers have to fill in. And it looks like Mick Mulvaney is one of those. He he's just uh, he's a go getter. You can tell, by the way. Well, just by the way, Mick Mulvaney is this first uh, article is by Sylvan Lane from the Hill. The acting head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is reportedly mulling whether to go ahead with a multi-million dollar penalty for alleged mortgage fraud by Wells Fargo. Now, The Hill, I I was going to read the Reuters article. It's a little bit longer. But The Hill apparently is unaware that there's nothing alleged about this mortgage fraud. It was already adjudicated. I mean, even with their non-binding arbitration agreement that everybody has to sign, the arbitrator said, oh, Wells Fargo did this illegally. So, okay. Reuters reported that the CFPB and Wells Fargo had been hashing out a settlement over the bank charging potentially more than 100,000 mortgage borrowers on necessary fees. To lock in low mortgage rates. Remember remember that? Oh, yeah, you can lock it in. Acting CFPB Director Mick Mulvaney, also the, he, he's the head of the budget office, too. See, the White House budget director said last week he'd review each of the 14 pending enforcement actions left to him by former director Richard Cordray. Mulvaney. A staunch conservative had routinely spoken out against the CFPB as a congressman sponsoring bills to eliminate the agency. He and fellow Republicans have accused Cordray and the CFPB of abusing its unique independence and broad power to harm the financial markets. You know, the same ones that illegally uh, signed people up to credit cards and those people didn't know they had credit cards signed up in their names? You mean the industry that used predatory loans to uh, basically steal people's property? You mean the industry that manipulated the LIBOR uh, 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 rating agency and, uh, you know, all the rates were set illegally? You mean, you mean that financial industry? They are being harmed? So I guess it's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, meaning we got to protect fi- the financial industry from these consumers. Oh, God. Okay. The structure of the CFPB is fundamentally flawed. Authority that I have now as the acting director really should frighten people, Mulvaney said. Hmm. We're going to try to limit as much as we can what the CFPB does to sort of interfere with capitalism and with the financial services market. The way he says capitalism, it's sort of like, you know, the way a mobster says, you know, uh, you, 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 you got to pay me the money or you get a broken leg. It's, you know, you, you have a choice. There's all sorts of choices in the world. You have a choice. The acting director, meaning Mulvaney, imposed a 30-day hiring and regulatory freeze upon assuming control of the CFPB last Monday and just began making payments from the Bureau's Civil Penalties Fund. One part of uh, the Hill's reportage here is that they have left out a very important part of this story, and that is whether Mulvaney should really even be sitting in the office, even though a uh, Trump appointed uh, judge said, oh, yeah, it's OK for him to come in here, even though uh, the chain of command is totally different. Just let Trump do whatever he wants. He put me where I'm at. And I don't know nothing. Oh, God. 
Mulvaney said he's reviewing the various lawsuits CFPB is involved in and has already sought delays in two cases where his opinion differs from Cordray's. Mulvaney also said he's analyzing the CFPB's budget for potential savings and continuing efforts to bolster the agency's cybersecurity protections. He said the CFPB would stop collecting personally identifiable information until the Bureau has a better handle on the data it stores, meaning we, we got all the data about you. We just got to figure a way of being able, being able to weaponize it against you, you consumer terrorists. Well, moving along here, uh, our next item off the menu is by the great Sarah K. Burris from Raw Story. A New York restaurant's owner and top chef had been hit with a class action suit accusing them of wage theft. Just as the owner is set to open a new location inside Donald Trump's Washington, D.C. Trump International Hotel. Alessandro Borgnone was named specifically in the lawsuit alleging the servers were not paid a minimum wage and tips were divided improperly and improperly dis- distributed. Also named was renowned chef Daisuke Nakazawa the Restaurant was also called out for failing to pay overtime wages and failing to give required wage notices, the lawsuit alleges. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, you know, pooling tips, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. It's it, the, the whole idea of gratuity, I, I and I got to tell you, I lived on, on gratuities. I, that, that my wage that was taken up. I remember working as a bartender and a waiter and what I made on my paycheck was pay was given for taxes. And then I just lived on the cash I made every day and I wasn't alone. That's just how you did it. But the idea of it and, and it's a uh, resonance of a particular kind of, I don't know, obscene servitude uh, has has made me change my mind a bit. Now, being an owner chef, uh, I guess I would have loved to have like stolen the tips from my, from my servers. I, I, I would have, because there were many times when they were going home with, you know, a hundred dollars or $200 in their pocket and I was still paying out. I wasn't making any money. So I would have loved to have, like, absconded with their cash. And there are ways to do it, too. And this guy, Alessandro Borgnone, really figured a good way. And the reason why is because it's an old tried and true and practiced method. The, uh, oh, also Borgnone has already come under fire for attacking the Washington, D.C. food scene as meat and potato city. Well, you can do a lot with meat and potatoes. I mean, gosh, I've heard that Persian food is just meat and potatoes of the desert. And it's not even really a desert. The suit goes on to allege that Borgnone told employees he had been too generous with staff financially. And he stated that he was setting new rules for how the restaurant would be closed and how employees would cash out each night. Meaning you clean up the restaurant, but that's on you're off the clock can't do that from there he allegedly restructured the company's tip pool where servers put their tips together and distribute it equally among each other his new structure included tips for management bussers hosts and kitchen staff who are ineligible for tips if those employees also receive tips they fall under the tipped wage guidelines which is significantly lower than the federal minimum wage for non-tipped workers well in my day, it was kind of up to us individually, and you would be shamed into making sure you paid the bussers and uh, the kitchen staff and uh, the bar backs properly. Because if you didn't, uh, you you would find out quick. But it re- was really up to each of us individually. You know, what we made, then, you know, there was a third or, or more that went out. Maybe even half, depending. 
but I don't know. The Post notes that there, oh, the Washington Post notes there is already a controversy brewing within the Department of Labor about tip pools. New regulations would allow for for what Borgnone did. Because since, you know, Trump has his in-house restaurants, he would love to steal people's wages and the tips that they made. Wouldn't any owner of a restaurant who's not making money and they're watching their servers walk out with all that cash? The proposed rule does nothing more than authorize wage theft on the part of the employer. Attorney Molly Elkin said she's currently a partner at Washington law firm William McGilvery, which focuses on labor law. The employer cannot simply pocket the tips, but Trump's Labor Department doesn't care. And the restaurant is scheduled to open in Washington, D.C. in February. Borgnone has been called the most hated restaurateur in America and has an openly hostile relationship with celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain, who said of Borgnone, I have utter contempt for him. Utter and complete contempt. And uh, I got to be honest with you, I do too. All right, this next plate that we have now brought back from the kitchen out here to the front cafe is an article by Zach Ford out of Think Progress. The Senate Banking Committee could vote this month to approve former Congressman Scott Garrett repug. Oh, I I should mention uh, throughout West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, whether we're in the front cafe or back at the chef's table, uh, we we run by uh, the restaurant rule of, in this reporter's opinion, all right, just so you know, in this reporter's opinion, so we cannot blame Zach Ford for that uh, uh, pejorative of repug. That's in this reporter's opinion, even though it's true. Scott Garrett, repug of New Jersey, as the president of the Export-Import Bank, which helps U.S. businesses broker deals abroad. Trump, who previously opposed the Export-Import Bank before reversing course, because, you know, for all this guy's vaunted business acumen, he had no idea what the Export-Import Bank did, because he doesn't make anything. He just signs his name, and that's supposed to be hard work. Okay, nominated Garrett, who previously tried to shut down the bank back in April because of his many divisive positions. His nomination was steeped in controversy. If you are tasked with deconstructing the administrative state, what better person than to uh, fill the positions of authority and deconstruct these departments in the administrative state? Department by department. Garrett has a long history of making radical statements and casting votes that are offensive to people of all stripes. He once said that ethnicities are inherently untrustworthy, later clarifying that he had met people in other countries. But, you know, I mean, brown people look the same over in other countries as they do here. So, come on, I mean, you have to lump them all together. It's only human. He refused to support any version of the Violence Against Women Act. I guess there's something going on at home that uh, we might want to look into. Garrett also wants to privatize Social Security. Well, that's what they've been trying to do since FDR even, uh, you know, thought of it as, uh, you know, actually, he didn't really think of it. He stole it. From Hiram Johnson in California, when was the ham and eggs movement? But they've been trying to take it since California with Hiram Johnson at the ham and eggs movement. Let's privatize that. And thought that disaster relief after Hurricane Sandy for his home state of New Jersey was wasteful spending. It's only wasteful spending if they're not able to dip into it. Okay, I think that's what he means. Garrett also advocated extensively against gay rights. He refused to pay his dues to the National Republican Campaign Committee in 2015 because it occasionally recruited and supported openly gay candidates. Because he's old school. If you're going to be like gay, you got to be in the closet. Come on. Because they've always had 
people of all types of sexual persuasions, and some people had to hide. If cons- confirmed, Garrett would serve alongside Claudia Slasic, who has been nominated to the Export Import Board of Directors. In her opening statement to the committee last month, she spoke openly of her spouse, Susan Davis, who attended the hearing to support her. I guess that made Garrett angry. Garrett's controversial record and past opposition to the Export-Import Bank has led to some complicated politicking throughout his confirmation. The controversy over Garrett's nomination is itself a problem for the bank, as the National Association of Manufacturers, which strongly opposes his confirmation, pointed out. The time being spent considering him has consequences for those imp- impacted by the bank's work because conservatives have opposed filling the bank's board for the past several years. It has 37 and a half, let me repeat that, 37 and a half billion, b- 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 billion with a B, impending transactions that are stalled by lack of a quorum. Huh. Without the revenue from those transactions, both businesses and taxpayers will miss out. Those deals were projected to produce a $492 million surplus that would be returned to the Treasury. The National Association of Manufacturers is calling on the Senate to reject Garrett, but approve the other board members so that the bank can resume its work. The only way to make America great again, you know, is to keep American businesses from being able to sell their wares. Well, let's get on to our break and we'll come back and go through the weather. And uh, then, of course, uh, the items off the menu that we will have at the chef's table. So uh, you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. The Trump tax plan is not selling well. Indeed, two-thirds of the American people oppose it, and only 16% believe it would reduce their tax bill. But wait, say Trump and his congressional trumpeteers. We're really trying to help you commoners. How? By killing the death tax. So when you die, your estate can go to your heirs without that inheritance being taxed. As the president so eloquently put it, to protect millions of small businesses and the American farmer, we are finally ending the crushing, the horrible, the unfair estate tax. Hooray! Donald is saving us! Actually, no. The great majority of Americans don't own farms, businesses, or big estates of any kind. So that tax doesn't even apply to us. Also, 99% of the people who do have farms and businesses are already exempt from the tax since it only applies to estates worth five and a half million dollars or more. I realize that Trump prefers grandiose claims over actual facts, but here are a few reality checks showing that his statement is not just a lie, it's a whopper. This year, a mere two-tenths of one percent of American families will inherit enough money to owe any estate tax. That's only about 11,000 families, not millions, as Trump so theatrically proclaimed. As for protecting our nation's family farm and small business estates from taxation, only 80 of those are big enough to be subject to the tax this year. So who exactly is Trump saving from having to pay some taxes on their multi-million dollar estates? The richest 0.2% of American families, including one named Trump. This is Jim Hightower saying killing the estate tax lets a handful of elites, the richest of the richest, escape from paying more than $20 million each. And that's what the Trump plan really is all about. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know. 
along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Thursday, December 7th, 2017. I'm Mark Belanger. In Libya, the police are harassing union leaders as they try to represent their members and tell their stories globally. See Marie Ainsborough reports. Unions around the world are mobilizing to protect the General Secretary of the Dockers and Seafarers Union of Libya. Nirmana Sharif, a woman, has been attacked, constantly threatened with murder, and subject to ongoing harassment by the police. She is an active and internationally recognized advocate for both human and trade union rights. In the latest incident, Ms. Al-Sharif was detained by the authorities, who then confiscated her passport. She had been scheduled to attend a conference in Morocco organized by the International Transport Workers Federation, the ITF. Just recently, support for Ms. Al-Sharif was given by delegates attending the biannual conference of women in male-dominated occupations and industries. We are the Sisters of the Women Doi 2017 Conference. We are the Sisters of the Women Doi 2017 Conference. We are in Brisbane, Australia. We are in Brisbane, Australia. We are sending a message. We are sending a message. To our sister, Nerman Sharif. To our sister, Nerman Sharif. A trade union sister that we love and respect. A trade union sister that we love and respect. Stay strong, sister. Stay strong, sister. We are with you. We are with you. An online campaign to show support for Ms. Al Sharif is being conducted on Labor Start, the Labor Movement's news and campaigning service. For more information, visit www.laborstart.org. I'm Seamary Ainsborough. The fourth global conference on the sustained eradication of child labor, held in November, concluded with the adoption of a declaration outlining what needs to be done for the world's 152 million child laborers. The declaration was presented in video form at the end of the conference in Buenos Aires. Fourth Global Conference on the Sustained Eradication of Child Labor. Buenos Aires Declaration, 16th November 2017. Noting that there are 152 million girls and boys still engaged in child labor, with 73 million in its worst forms. 25 million people, including more than 4 million children, are still subject to forced labor, and 71 million youth are unemployed. We declare our commitment to the eradication of child labor and forced labor and call upon governments, social partners, international and regional organizations, civil society organizations, and all other relevant stakeholders to take up the following actions. Accelerate efforts to end child labor in all its forms by 2025 and to eradicate forced labor by 2030. Seek to align as a matter of urgency, policies, strategies, and time-bound action plans at corresponding levels. Promote integrated, coherent, and effective public services and policies. Strengthen the capacity of and involve public authorities, social partners, civil society, local communities, and enterprises. Strengthen the organizational capacity of local communities to prevent, detect, and eliminate child labor and forced labor. Strengthen national legal frameworks and their enforcement. Strengthen the capacity of labor inspection and other enforcement services. Take effective measures to prevent child labor and forced labor. Build and maintain national social security systems. Ensure equal access to free public and compulsory education for all children. Retain children, especially girls and other children in vulnerable situations, in quality and inclusive educational systems. Favor evidence-based strategies to promote a smooth school-to-work transition. Promote the transition from informal to formal economies, social development and innovation. 
promote inclusive rural development to eradicate and prevent child labor and forced labor. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From United Nations headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. Protests broke out across Palestine and a number of Middle Eastern capitals on Thursday, a day after President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Thousands gathered in the Palestinian city of Bethlehem to voice frustration with Trump's decision before crowds were broken up by Israeli police. The militant group Hamas, based in Gaza, is calling on Palestinians to launch another intifada or uprising against Israel. While widespread violence has not been reported, the U.S. government is nonetheless warning American citizens in dozens of countries to avoid protests and large crowds. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said Thursday the U.S. won't lift sanctions on Russia until Russian troops exit Crimea and contested parts of Ukraine. Here was Tillerson at a press conference alongside the president of Austria. The issue that stands in the way is Ukraine. And we've made this clear to Russia from the very beginning that we must address Ukraine. It it stands as the single most difficult obstacle to us renormalizing a relationship with Russia, which we badly would like to do. The U.S. has maintained sanctions against Russia since early 2014. And the German politician Martin Schulz is proposing the creation of a United States of Europe, a new federal country born from the European Union. In a speech Thursday, Schulz said the countries opposed to the idea should just leave the EU and let others take the lead. Schulz's comments come as the EU prepares to sue three countries, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, for failing to take in enough refugees. The idea of a United States of Europe has slipped in and out of fashion since the 1800s, but polls suggest a narrow majority of Europeans now favor the idea of closer ties that could culminate in the creation of a new country. For more global news headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com. Okay, folks, we have moved everything back to the chef's table, and uh, the crew is cleaning up the front cafe as we speak. Uh, I have some uh, special menu items for you today that are actually off the menu, and uh, we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but do uh, we, we do thank you for uh, joining us here on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and uh, why don't we get right into the weather. Local weather here at the, where the mothership is located, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, it is currently 25 degrees. A white, crusty frost covers everything. It looks very wintry, yes. And at 25 degrees, it feels wintry. And we are going to have the same temperature as we had yesterday, which was in the mid-50s. Zero percent chance of precipitation, and that will be the case for at least the next seven days or so. And I always keep my fingers crossed for rain. Of course, at this temperature, it'll be snow. The air quality index is only moderate at 61. We have a bit of an air stagnation uh, event going on because of people burning uh, wood in their fireplaces to keep warm. I can't blame them. Uh, Pressure is at 30.54 inches. Visibility at 9 miles. Humidity is 65%. Okay, so weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they have purchased, and these people live around the world. London is 38 and partly cloudy. Uh, Paris is 38 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 58 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 36 and fair. Uh, Kabul is 42 with smoke. They're, They're way past air stagnation and haze. They have smoke. Got to keep warm. Hong Kong is 59 and fair. Hmm. Uh, Hong Kong, I'm sorry, Tokyo is uh, 
Uh, 39 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 66 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California, 48 partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 36 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they have purchased. And these people live around the world. All right. Well, uh, since it is the 47th anniversary of uh, John Lennon's murder, I thought it would be appropriate uh, here at the chef's table that uh, well, we dig back into, uh, well, the old recipes tucked away uh, in the old cookbooks. And uh, I found uh, uh, a much longer interview, in fact, the whole show of Dick Cavett, uh, from 11 September of 1971, but uh, I've extracted uh, uh, just some of it to fill in for the time here at the uh, chef's table. So why don't we take a listen to John Lennon and, y and Yoko Ono on the old Dick Cavett show, and uh, then we'll we'll be back and we'll say our adieus then. So this is uh, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Dick Cavett, 11 September of 1971. I guess you all know that, um, that uh, John Lennon, uh, together with the three other fellows uh, named uh, McCartney and Harrison and Starr, uh, were responsible for becoming, uh, I guess, the most written about, most listened to, most imitated uh, musical group uh, of the 60s. And for about eight years, uh, they were leaders in the musical world. And not only that, but it probably affected what um, a decade of young people uh, looked like and thought about and dreamed of. And uh, they achieved the absolute pinnacles of success. They were even honored by the Queen, an honor which they eventually uh, returned, I believe. Uh, I'm sure it doesn't uh, come as a surprise to anyone that the Beatles are no longer together. Um, in, in recent months, John Lennon and uh, has, well, John has sort of surfaced in the underground press where he gave a long interview in Rolling Stone magazine, in which he talked with some a great deal of candor and uh, some uh, bitterness, I suppose, about the old days. And his wife, Yoko Ono, is maybe uh, uh, one of the most controversial ladies since the Duchess of Windsor, uh, Wally Simpson, uh, kept the uh, Duke from becoming the king. Uh, tonight they are, however, quite above ground, and I'm very pleased to welcome them here. Will you welcome, please, John Ono Lennon and Yoko Ono. <laughs> How are you? Uh, nervous, but okay, thank you. Are you really? Yes. Are now, you? Is that a, a little bit, yeah. but uh, it isn't as if we've never met, because we, we did meet once. We did meet in yeah. a dingy hotel room. Right. <laughs> so you're Jack Lemmon. Yes. <laughs> and you're oh, Fred Astaire. Yeah. <laughs> or is it Orson Welles? I'm not Fred Astaire. <laughs> Yoko, how are you? Fine, thank you. Good, good, okay. Um, is there anything that you want to know about me to start off with that we could <laughs> just to sort of what, get what the, do you do for to, a living? to get the <laughs> uh, actually this is my profession oh, I know well, you I lived here. yeah I, I practically do I hardly ever get out of here the chair collapses into a bed and uh, it must I, be hard it's it a it's a bed do, do you have my kind of show uh, in all yeah. over the world uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they're not everywhere. quite as good you know they what? They're not quite as good in England at uh, yeah. repartee, you know. Why is this? Well, they're, they're more uh, inhibited, that's all. The, the you know, they don't have anybody that would sort of freak out mm -hmm. a little. Yeah. Unless Jerry Rubin comes on, you know. Oh, yeah. Rubin came over and, made, and disrupted uh, uh, a show done by... Uh, I can never think of the guy's name. David Dost? David Drost, yeah. yes. It was very exciting. Yeah, it was a very exciting show, actually. What actually happened? They came in and broke up the studio? They broke up the studio, and David ended up in the audience to show that he wasn't with uh, the young people, you know, which shows uh. where he is at, really. Not <laughs> very personal, David, wherever you are, red light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, right. you know, I had a terrible feeling that um, m my hair was going to be longer than yours. Uh, it's a funny thing, because I met you the other day. I, the recent pictures I'd seen of both of you, yours is 
extremely long, Yoko, and yours, John was very long. And of yeah. course, people going around saying, you know, I can't tell which one is which, you know. Oh, you know, yes. That sort of <laughs> well, uh, witticism. Uh, last year I cut mine, uh, we both cut it right off down to about a quarter of an inch, uh, 69 yeah. or 70, I can't remember. Because uh, I just suddenly realized it wasn't functional, you know, to mm -hmm. have it. When I had it down here, you just have to keep washing it and combing it. You know. yeah. So then I chopped it all off and then... Then it just grew a bit, and then I just let it grow to this length. Mm. What, what do you, what's your favorite length, Yoko? Are you at it right now? Well, it depends. You know, we like change, and we just don't want to stick to one. Who wants the you know, same old haircut mm -hmm. every day, you know? No. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Have my... a different one every few months. You know? <laughs> that's my thing. Did you save the hair uh, uh, by oh, yeah. any chance? Uh, one you... time we cut it, we gave it to uh, some uh, Michael uh, Malik, who was running a sort of black house in London which wasn't exactly a Black Panther thing, but it was, I think it was something to do with it. And uh, mm -hmm. they were just having a community centre in London, and we sort of symbolically gave it them. They were going to auction it off at uh, wherever you auction mm -hmm. hair off, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's quite Some, nice. That big place in London, I can't remember the name. Sotheby's? Yeah, that's it. Oh. It never happened, though. But it was a symbolic gesture, really. So you don't Solidarity. Ding. And that hair, th that hair today, then, is, is missing? Gone tomorrow. Yeah. Mm. Silly, silly, isn't it? Oh, you're going to do this all the time. spent this much time. Though. It's gone already. Yoko, do you, do you have fun when you're over here in, uh, in this country? Oh, yes, very much. Because after all, this is my second home time. Yeah. She lived here for ten years. People are surprised. They often say she speaks very good English. Oh. Uh, but you, you, you've been here a lot. Um, well, some people ask me, well, can you speak Japanese? And then I get very offended, you know, because I am Japanese. Can you speak Japanese? Japanese. <laughs> yeah. You now you've offended her, haven't you? <laughs> Get, get me out of this, China. Well, a uh, funny thing mm. happened on the uh, way I'm in tonight. To. It never has to me. Normally. Not <laughs> once in my life. Nothing happened. You were whatsoever. telling me about that story, you know, whenever they talk to us and then they're not listening and then you start about that elephant. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you, I suppose you get it, too, it's when people meet you. Us, you, know. you know, like in a restaurant or anywhere, when you're trying to order something, mm -hmm. you find that they're so struck by, oh, is it really you, that they don't really hear your order, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking to them, I'm saying, uh, I'd like a steak, medium, and uh, two elephants came and a policeman bit my head off, and a cup of tea, please. <laughs> and they're saying, yes, thank you. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're not listening, you know. Probably half of them aren't listening now, which is a good thing, I suppose. That, that's a terrible feeling, yeah. to think that they're never listening at all. Well, it's, it's surreal, you know, I don't mind yeah. that. Have you ever had elephant actually brought to you by someone who was listening? Or? And uh, bit the policeman's head off quite often, yes. <laughs> It's an old Anglo I'll, custom. I'll know. believe anything. Mm. Mm. Where, um, you like being over here, I gather. I've had some English guests on. What do you think of yourself as English, first of all? Let's establish that. Well, uh, yeah. sometimes, I mean, if, we, if, like, if you ask, talking about being over here or being over there, over then here. I think, well, I'm from over there, you know. Yeah. But uh, I normally think in terms of, uh, I suppose I think in cliques and things like other people, like musicians and or mm -hmm. long hairs and or under 30, over 30, etc., etc. And being married to a Hawaiian, it makes you sort of more international, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So Must be a mistake in my that, notes. You know? Well, people think of us as, uh, especially in England, not so much here, we get a bit more respect in America as artists, but in, in uh, back home, I think it's the case for all artists, back home it's a bit like, I'm the man that won the pools and lucky guy who had a spot of luck and married a Hawaiian actress, you know? Uh -huh. mm. And, uh, which isn't true, really. Do you get yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> because uh, I'm from Japan and he's from England, yeah. so somehow we found out that we're sort of passionately patriotic sometimes, you know, and we get, well, mm -hmm. no, I mean, that's Japanese made, or no, no, I mean, you know, English are the first ones to do I mean, do we this, invented radar you know, and penicillin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it a fine to turn into a hard hat, you see, when we start mm -hmm. discussing, you know, mm -hmm. well, we're both islands and we're both little and we both did this and we both did that. And we find ourselves turning quite fascist, discussing it. Yeah. We do. <laughs> Made in Hong Kong and all that. Yeah. And you do jokes with each other, and you kid her about... Always laughing, Dick. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Give me a laugh. After no. this... I mean, would you, would you stoop to, you, you know, Pearl Harbor jokes? And that oh, yeah, we do, I do all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw speak English, can I so <laughs> English pig. A kabuki thing. Oh yeah, have you, there's a kabuki you know theatre in Japan and they have a I massive know. stage and on stage they have the musicians with them. 
And all the men played the part, you see. And all the men played the women's part. So that's kabuki, you see. I learned it after only one sitting. It's very good. Do you know what it is? They start to laugh when he does that because it really is Japanese when he does that. I mean, kabuki, you know. Only our hip nips will notice that how funny it is, actually. There are two of them in Utah breaking up right now. I've seen one on on TV with yellow glasses, and he calls himself the hip nip. And he pretended to be Italian in the war. Oh, I remember. Is, 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 is Mr. Uh, Lennon putting me on? <laughs> I don't know. Ah. Uh, okay. Fast in the time, best in thing from the ganze Welt. You have a little bit Spanish. Que pasa? Whose move is it? We have a brief message of interest from people of various creeds and colors, and we will return. There we are. May I? Now that we're fu- through making fun of each other's nationalities <laughs> and other people's, you were saying. Yes, I just discovered. You know, so John was d- d- saying that he discovered that I chain smoke through this article that he was reading about me. You know, somebody said I chain smoke. I had no Ah, is that what it is now? And since then, you know, he never gets off that one. But I just noticed it. Um, like what do you another see? You mean in the video <laughs> that you chain smoke? Mm. Oh, smoking kills, you see. It is. It does. You know, you're setting yeah. a bad example Didn't for work, adults Janet. all over the uh, all over the world. Uh, Didn't yeah. work, Arthur. Le- Le- is just that, does that ever happen to you, that you find out something about the other from something you read rather than Oh, actually? sure, sure. I mean, I, I began to suspect she chain smoke because every time I kiss her, I burnt my chin. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I read it in an article. That's so, a yeah. wonderful delivery you've got. That's great. Really, that's well, great. Uh, you know, yeah. back on the boards. Yeah. But um, what, what was I, what was I going to say just before that? Do you something have any about, idea? Um, um, we're talking yeah. about... Uh, um, articles written about you and all oh, yes, well, I know I know where I was I know where I was yeah. earlier I said you you seem to like it here because I've had English guests on British yeah, guests uh, who said they come here because they're stifled over there and they can't work and they like the exhilaration here but then I've had American writers yeah. who have left America because they feel so menaced and threatened that they like the calm of London yeah well somebody I'm, like Richard Chamberlain went over there and did very well you know from going from the soap opera to Hamlet and uh, vice versa, I suppose people have come over here and broadened the scope. I think it's just a matter of you have a different kind of feeling when you're abroad, you know, maybe you can loosen up. But in Britain, we only have two channels of TV. And mm-hmm. if you watch the old British movies on, on TV now here, it's the same old men always on TV in Britain still, you know. They have a sort of school of actors. There's about three new people got into the profession since I was 10. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit yes. limiting, you know. Yeah. The- Oh, you do see uh, yeah. all the same old faces. But the best thing about British TV is the live stuff, you know, like mm-hmm. plays and things like that. But uh, it, it just goes off at 12, you know, so if you, you have a choice in England of either going out to dinner mm. or watching TV, you can't do both, like. But at, with America, it's great. You just sort of wake up and it's on and you, you get back after going out for an evening and it's still on. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's nice if you're sick. I love you know, it. You know when you're sick and you're up I'm all night? I'm always sick. That's why I like it. So. <laughs> <laughs> According to something I was but reading. But the TV's all right, though, in a way. You know, they have also some nice... Well, it's not bad, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting used to British TV more than Japanese TV, of course, you know. Oh, yeah. I feel British sometimes, you know, that way. You do, does your accent change slightly when you're in England? I don't know. Yeah. People tell me that mm-hmm. I have Liverpool accent now. And she used to have an American accent uh, yeah. being educated here at those funny schools. Now. Sarah Lawrence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, <laughs> it's a I funny place, stayed, isn't it? You know, I was there. Do, do, you have, do you still have friends from Sarah Lawrence that you're uh, in, in touch no. with? Ah, well, there was one that turned oh, yes, out to be a snide. Uh, Tell yes. him about that. A snide? No, well, yes. you see, a classmate of mine, uh, sort of about two years ago, that was when we went really that famous that we were together, but yeah. we were just the first article in America on us both yes. since we got together. it was very important for me, actually, look. because we sort of, I was introduced to America through that article, mm-hmm. and she was a classmate of mine, so I thought, oh, that's nice. So uh, she came, and I thought, well, you know, since we are friends, so I should cook for her and all that, and I made a nice lunch for her. And then she wrote that, uh, who was it that... Oh, she said that um, uh, Yoko was, uh, looked fat like an old witch cooking. She was nine months pregnant and just had a miscarriage. And that... Uh, I resemble Ernest Resembled Ernest Borgnine, you know. <laughs> well, you can see that she doesn't. 
And that was this old pal that had sneaked in to see us. You you do like her in a sport. I I just want to say Betty Rollins' legs. (laughs) Was it Betty Rollins? Yeah. The article? Oh. Good old Betty, old pal of Yoko's. Betty Rollins' legs. She says in the Betty Rollins' legs. (laughs) Okay, I think we can leave that one out. It's silly to be so bitter, isn't it? Oh, yes, this, but... There's something about her legs. I, I never noticed anything wrong with her legs when I was married to her. Did you? <laughs> you weren't looking, obviously. <laughs> she kept them long skirts on all the time. I so. was never. In Were fact, as a, as a matter of fact, no, I wasn't. But she wrote an article on. recently in which she said I was delicious. Well, maybe she's uh, had a pill or something. <laughs> <laughs> But do you have, uh, you don't go to reunions at Sarah Lawrence. You were only there about a year then, I gather. Uh, three years, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I didn't want to graduate, you know. I was th- one of those early dropouts. I just felt it was so ridiculous to go another year. I just couldn't stand it. And uh-huh. in those days, people said, well, it's so silly to not graduate, you know, that bit. Because mm-hmm. you'll just never just get a job. Say, right, right. Yeah. I was a bit afraid of that, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you'll never but, make it. Mm-hmm. That's what they told me, too. That y- if you didn't finish school. One maths master wrote, you're on the road to failure if he carries on this way. <laughs> Have you ever, do you ever see your old schoolmates? Uh, uh, no, I've seen a few old school friends, not teachers. No. Yeah. Uh, most of them dislike me, except for one or two. You know. So I am always glad to remind them. Was there ever a teacher that... <laughs> incredible awareness they had. Was there ever a teacher who did inspire you? Yes, there, there was always one teacher in each school that would uh, usually be an art teacher or an English language or literature kind of thing. If there's anything mm-hmm. to do with writing or art, I was okay at it. Anything to do with science and maths, I just couldn't get it in, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but most subjects were science and maths because uh, supposedly they don't want artists, you know. Even at art school, they tried to turn me into a teacher. They tried to discourage you from painting and, you know, why not be a teacher because then you can paint on Sunday. Mm-hmm. I decided against it. You know, your drawings are look a little like James Thurber's. Uh, well, I, I used to love his stuff when I was a kid. Oh, did you start look like yeah. a bit like yours, you know, I think. Well, yeah. he's older than me, so he oh, came first, so I look like him. <laughs> <laughs> I used to read nice those stuff point. when I was a kid. That, uh, three people I was very keen on, Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, Thurber, and an English uh, drawer, or whatever you call him, called Ronald Searle. Ronald Searle. Oh, we yeah. get him over here. Yeah, so yeah. when I was about 11, I was turned on to those three. When I was, well, I think I was about 15 when I started therberizing the drawings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. That was my imitation of Nigel Bruce, one of your actors. I saw. Oh, really, Holmes? Remember he played Watson in the, in the Sherlock Holmes movies? Yes. Oh, really, Holmes? It's dynamite, usually. Ella Fitzgerald, dear Watson. You thought, you thought it was Ella Fitzgerald? No, no, Ella Fitzgerald, dear Watson. That's a pun on elementary. Oh, elementary, my dear Watson, that's right. <laughs> okay, yeah. Ella Fitzgerald. That's known. That's known as wordplay. Yes. I'm oh, I can play that. Myself. Sure. <laughs> Betty Rollins' legs. Hmm? <laughs> our <laughs> local station. <laughs> we, we we will be rolling further after this message from our. <laughs> All right, and that does bring us uh, to the end of our uh, broadcast period for today and for the week. But uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy will be open on Monday, same time, same station. And uh, we'll uh, have River City Hash Mondays as our daily special, of course. And we'll be happy to see you then. Uh, Stay tuned for some great uh, content over the weekend and uh, for the rest of the day. And why don't you just listen to Netroots Radio 24-7-365 and we will uh, be with you on Monday here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. 
Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golf clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 